You're listening to the Haney Company Financial Guy Show. No nonsense, just a crazy mix of life, business, the funny, and of course we're going to talk about your money. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. What could go wrong? All right, welcome to another episode of the Haney Company Financial Guy Show. I am always excited for all the amazing guests that I get to have on this show, but particularly for this episode's guest, because Brad Eisenberg and I get to talk about something in, in probably an area that we haven't really covered ground on. So this is going to be treading of new ground on a topic that we'll have to see how it goes today, Brad, because I think knowing you and I, we can take it any number of wonderful places. So I'm very, very excited for this conversation. I appreciate you joining me today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Let's have some fun. All right. Well, the fun usually starts after the first initial questions. They are tough. They're like screeners, right? So you got to get through the gauntlet to get to the good stuff. So let's just hit it hot and heavy. What is the number one place that you have always wanted to visit, but you have yet to visit? Oh man, yeah, hitting it hitting it hard real soon. <laughs> I, I I am an avid traveler. I absolutely love discovering different corners of the world. For many years, my number one was hiking the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. And fortunately, I've crossed that one off the list. So my number two has become my number one, which is to go scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef off Australia. And fingers crossed, it's looking likely that that one will happen next year. So I'm pretty excited. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is awesome. Certainly as a, so your first one sounds amazing. It's somewhere in my list and on my radar for sure. So I I bet that was just fabulous. Life-changing, absolutely life-changing. Yeah. Now, scuba diving for me. So there, there's only one thing on the entire planet I'm afraid of, and that's sharks. So <laughs> it doesn't quite ever make it anywhere with me, just because of that. And I, but you know, in in other waters or in other parts of the country, I'm sure it'd be amazing. But uh, yeah, I mean, the Great Barrier Reef itself and that whole area in Australia sounds awesome. So we'll have to have a part two after you after you accomplish that. Oh, for sure. <laughs> All right. Would you rather explore outer space or under the ocean? And I'm wondering how, based on on your answer to the first question, you're going to answer this one. You could probably guess the answer. <laughs> under, uh, yeah, under the ocean. I mean, A, there's more stuff down there. You know, like outer space is pretty empty. And I, I guess I'm also one of these guys that just likes likes to always have one foot grounded in some reality that I'm in while the other one is kind of reaching to new territory. So something about the the ocean being a little bit closer to home, being able to relate it to to my life and world is probably <laughs> is what pulls me in that direction as opposed to just being off floating somewhere in space. Yeah, I I, I think I, I waver back and forth. Neither of these for me really resonates, to be honest, because it, it, there's both like there's the scariness of it. And then there's also just kind of the, you know, the unknown part of, do I really feel that this is like a dimension that I'm super interested in? But I think I, I would certainly agree with you. I would lean more towards under the ocean, despite my my shark fear, simply because, yeah. you know, there's just got to be some really cool, unexplored territory out, you know, just we can who find knows. Some places for you without sharks. Yeah, I, yeah, I know that. I know they're not everywhere. So um, <laughs> I like that. All right. If you could have a meal with someone famous, alive or dead, who would you want to have a meal with? You know, I think I would love to have a meal with Julia Child. Okay. I, I'm an avid cook. I love cooking. I love food. I love watching things about food. I love going out to incredible places, whipping up meals at home. And I mean, Julia, not only because of the food connection, just strikes me as somebody whose success was driven by her authenticity. She was like exactly who she was. And probably a lot of people at the time would have deemed her completely unqualified to do the things that she did. You know, not a not a professionally trained cook, you know, certainly no background in TV. Her cookbook was the first thing she had written. And she was kind of an underdog, but it was that authenticity and charm that really was behind her success and not the things that might have been traditionally associated or attributed to success. And I think that aspect just really intrigues me. I'd love to have a meal with her. I hmm. love that. And, and and don't know that I knew half of what you had shared about her. So that yeah, that sounds fascinating and fun. Wow. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Good answer. Good answer. All right. Besides this podcast, which of course is everybody's number. Of what course. other podcast? Always, always. Oh, what other podcast though have you enjoyed that you would want somebody else to consider listening to as well? Yeah, this is a tough one. I'd probably choose between, you know, two 
I mean, Malcolm Gladwell's revisionist history is incredible. He's just, he has this way with words. He's an amazing storyteller. But I, I think if I had to pick one, it would be How I Built This with Guy Raz. I mean, obviously, you know, passionate about business and entrepreneurship. And I love, love, love hearing people's origin stories of how they came to start their business, their journey along the way. And I think Guy is just incredible at asking insightful questions that really just get these people that are typically we put on pedestals as, you know, models of success. And he just has this way of humanizing them and getting us all to see that, like, you know, behind every success, there's a lot of, you know, dirt and struggle and just humanity. And I I, I love seeing kind of the humanity behind a business story and, and kind of what got people to where they're at. Love, love both of that. And, and I think there's not a Malcolm Gladwell book I have not consumed at least once, okay. not more than once. So okay. which was um, your favorite? But, you know, that's a tough question. I, I still think Blink, probably because I've read it the most number of times. But I mean, again, like, you know, I can't, you know, his name's on on the cover. I'm reading it. That's yeah. pretty much the way I approach well, it. If you, if you like Malcolm, he, his, he just dropped a podcast about how Blink was going to become a movie. And there was an entire screenplay written to be adapted, you know, to adapt Blink to the silver screen. And it never happened. And he tells that whole story of what killed that project. So you, you got to check it out, Brian. Ooh, all right. Th- th- that was a whole bunch of good stuff there as well. Love it. All right. Well, but let's stay on that origin theme, because now I would love for you to tell the audience a little bit about yourself, because what you do is is fascinating and fun. So what's the story behind the story? You know, I I think there's probably always been an entrepreneur in me, you know, ever since I was a kid organizing fundraisers for school. But I I actually started my first business in college. That's when I guess the, the passion really ignited where I saw the opportunity to kind of create my own path through life. I actually went to school for mechanical engineering. And realized by the end of college that I didn't want to be a mechanical engineer. I was way more interested in engineering businesses than mechanical systems. And um, this path of entrepreneurship promised this, you know, life that you could pursue purpose and passion and make a living out of it where you weren't so dependent upon other people. And that was really intoxicating for me at the time. And so that, that first business was a bike sharing business probably a decade before the the streets of every major city became littered with scooters and bikes. We were actually the first to do it on campus at the University of Maryland in 2008. And around the same time, I start I, I joined an early startup in the energy efficiency business and kind of grew with that company from the, the, the ground up, ultimately leading that company as the chief operating officer and kind of seeing that company grow from teenage, you know, undisciplined startup into kind of a mature and sophisticated operating organization was just like the best thing that I've ever done. And it's really what inspired me to start my consulting business at the beginning of 2017. So, you know, Be Lean kind of picked up at the tail end of that other business, which I'm sure we'll get into. But, you know, for the past seven years, my focus has really been helping other businesses with that transformation, that transformational journey. You know, I I call myself a scalability consultant. And I love working with growing businesses that are kind of at that place in their growth trajectory where everything that used to be fun and simple is now messy and complex. And I really kind of dive in and help them pinpoint the areas of their business that are holding them back from reaching that next level, helping them fix those parts that are broken and really putting in place more streamlined, smooth and scalable operating infrastructure so they can kind of get out of the weeds and actually grow their business. So that's a little bit about, you know, what I do and where I came from. And I'm, I'm sure we'll dive into different parts of that as we as we go along. So, yes, let's let's do it right away, because I love all of that. And, and like you, I think I just have always had a passion for, you know, it ties into, I think, storytelling, like you were saying. And, and so, you know, entrepreneurialism as you know, is kind of an open marketplace where amazing stories come to life. So I, I just feel like that's so cool to be connected to and a part of in some way, shape or form. And so I want to I want to find out what what would you say is the most fun part of any day when you're working with someone? Oh, man, I like the aha moments are the most fun moment. You know, they don't happen every day. Right. But when you're kind of diving in with a business owner, they they have a very specific perspective on what's going on in their business, you know, what what their, you know, their story, real or otherwise, there's this narrative that's in their head and they can only look in their business through their own eyes. And being able to come in from an outside perspective and kind of look at their business from a couple of different angles 
and see things that maybe they're not seeing themselves that look in their eye, you know, when, when they, they get this new perspective on their business. And usually that leads to some new ideas for what we can do to solve problems or to, you know, innovate, to grow, to improve. That look is, is my favorite thing about what I do. I love that. Yeah. And, and, and I identify with that a lot too, because I feel like, you know, we, we have kind of a lot of crossover in some of the things that we are working with clients on. And certainly, you know, when I'm trying to dig in on some of the the financial or the money things or the people and personnel things, it is, it is fun when you kind of get to that place of realization and epiphany and, or, or just, you know, you, you kind of line things up and almost create a framework that allows somebody to see something as a lot more tangible when yeah. a lot of times it's kind of like it's vision, but you know, I don't really know what the, what the path looks like. Yeah. Especially so that's the, a lot of fun. The, especially in the financial world that you operate in, right? There's like so many money stories that people tell themselves of that really constrain the, the way that they see things. So I'm sure like some of those aha moments are really kind of big ones when, when you're helping people break down their money stories and actually get to the truth of what's going on. So many of our stories, I'm sure, run down similar tracks and paths too, because it, it, it's, I mean, it's never really about the money. It's about so many other yeah. things and how we feel and what we are and identity. And, you know, I, I, I always joke, what do I do? I'm part teacher, part therapist. And eventually we talk about money, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. The money is the means, right? To, to do with your life what you want. Yeah. And I view business the same way, right? Like nobody starts a business because they want to run a business. They start exactly. a business because they want to serve their clients. They're really passionate about the value they can deliver. They start their business because they want more you know, freedom and agency or flexibility in their life, or they want to provide for their, their family. But like the business is a vehicle. I think so many times we get caught up with like the business is the thing that we're trying to like succeed with, but the business is not the thing. A, a business is not a purpose. It's a vehicle for you to you know, achieve what, what, what you'd like to out of, out of life or, or otherwise. No, I, I think that that's such a good way of, of putting it. And, and when you're able to connect to a framework like that, I think a lot of times it makes it a little bit easier to start to look at it. Like you said, you know, Stephen Covey paradigm shift, you're able to see things a little bit differently, more effectively. I want to, you know, what are some of the most common challenges that you see people facing? Yeah, that's that. That's a tough one, right? Because there's there's so many different kinds of things. I mean, ultimately, what it comes down to when when businesses come to me, right, and they're seeking scalability, they want to scale their business. Usually, what's happened is the business has found a certain amount of success. It's grown in size, and th that addition of volume and complexity starts straining the business because. Most of my clients have kind of built out their business on their own, the, the, you know, the processes, the systems, the way the business runs. And once you hit, you know, certain degrees of complexity and size, a, a lot of the, that, are, that initial iteration of infrastructure kind of starts to break down, right? And, you know, breaks down in a few ways from inefficiency. I think a lot of my clients um, would like to be more efficient than they are. There's there's problems with visibility and control visibility and control of the business. Just having a grasp of exactly what's going on as all of these new variables are introduced, and there's kind of more stuff in the mix. And, and of course, you know, profit, right? Like profitability is, is a big challenge as well. Of can you maintain or improve those profitability margins as you grow in size and as you start introducing kind of new variables into the mix, whether those are new business lines, new service offerings or product offerings. A lot of the time, we businesses kind of assume that certain degrees of success that have worked in the past will translate to new ideas, and that's not always the case. So, you know, it's, it's really kind of, it all boils down to this idea that the business has reached a new level but the the infrastructure of the business has not, and that that introduces a number of challenges that that you know I love helping my clients fix. No, and, and I and I appreciate how you describe that because a lot of times I find when I'm talking to clients, we talk about a, like a business having a life cycle, so that way it, it kind of helps frame what particular part of the cycle you're in may may then lend itself to certain issues or growing pains or what have you. But it helps, I think, also my clients, again, step away, kind of see, oh, you know, I've only been thinking about it this way, or, or I've had, you know, a perpetual growth mindset, which is always great until it isn't, you know, yeah. and, and so just to be able to be like, well, well, maybe, maybe it's because you don't know necessarily where you are. 
and you've just felt like you're in this constant, like, you know, getting people beyond the startup and growth mindset to like, okay, you know what, you're, you've got something that's maybe a little bit more mature now. Yeah. And therefore, you know, the, the things that you want to try to really dial into are things that, that a more mature, stable business need to be looking at and not this kind of constant growth, constant, you know, up and to the right. Yeah. Which it's hard, you know, but, but there's no, you know, like there's no applicable timeline for everybody either. That's the other hard part. It's like, you know, what, what one company's season might last 12 to 18 months could be three years for the next. And so it's just kind of, yeah, trying to really figure out and diagnose, okay, where, where am I? And like mm -hmm. you were talking about what might be holding me back and, you know, it, yeah. Yeah, people, stuff, infrastructure. We talk a lot about, you know, financial capitalization. You know, are you are you able to do the right things with the stuff that comes in? Mm -hmm. All that kind of fun stuff, that's which is really, really that, interesting. The capital, the resources you have. Yeah. Yeah. And and so maybe that's that's one thing that I know I wanted to ask you about. So I, I, I commonly talk to a lot of people about what I call the concept of how do you maximize profitability during that life cycle, which is something and then we kind of get into the scenario and the narrative of, you know, at some point, if you ever want to exit and a sale might potentially be involved, whether it's some big sale to some disinterested third party, to another owner, to your employee, whatever it is. Like if you're going to have a liquidity event that's kind of sale oriented at some point, mm -hmm. how do you position yourself for maximum success? So that way, when that time comes, you're, you're, the delta between what you want and what you need is pretty big. So you can negotiate, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times business owners don't necessarily see, oh, what do I need to do along the way? to take enough out over time and set aside value for myself. So that way I don't over, you know, put myself in, in, in a challenging position saying I have to sell in order to capitalize. Yeah. So that was a long winded way to talk about how, how do you have a conversation that probably maybe looks a little bit different, but I imagine touches on some of that. Yeah. I, I think profit and you and I've had this conversation, right? When, when you look at a profit and loss statement and that profit is all the way at the bottom line, it's it's almost set up for us to think that like profit is the end goal. It's like the the end of the story. And it's and it's not, right? Profit is a is a resource that we can choose what to do with, right? And there are choices that we have in business with what we want to do with our profit, right? You you met you mentioned one option, which is let's take some profit off the table so that I can actually do the things in life that I want to do. That's the purpose of the one of the purposes we started the business in the first place, right? To to have a, a meaningful and enjoy a joyable life, provide for our family and the people that we care about. Like that's one option, right? Some other options for what you can do with profit when you look at it as as capital as an asset is I, I look into two broad buckets. One is we can use this to invest in something new, some innovative idea. Do we want to go after a new strategy? Do we want to enter a new market? Do we want to create a new a new service line? Do we want to invest this in in R and D? That's that's one area that we can deploy capital. And in that arena, I always work with my clients on looking at that in that those decisions as investments, right? That have a return. And what's the potential return on investment for those ideas that allow the business to kind of win overall, recognizing that usually in the arena of new and innovative and interesting, not every idea is going to be successful. Just like every you know stock isn't going to be a winner, right? In your financial portfolio, you need your winners to cover for your losers. So I work with businesses on kind of creating that an innovation strategy so that they're they're better you know, they're vetting those ideas in a more consistent way, um, executing on them in a more consistent way and measuring the results to actually learn whether those ideas have worked. But the other area that we can deploy profit to grow the business is kind of investing that profit into what I call the growth engine of the business. It's the core repeatable process that any organization runs off of, right? You spend that profit, you invest it in, in sales and marketing to acquire new clients, right? And you deliver your products and services to those clients. And hopefully you deliver those products and services in a way that leaves enough money on the table that you can then take that profit and reinvest it back into customer acquisition. And a lot of people think of when they look at how are we delivering our products and services, they look at margin, like what's the percent, you know, the profitability margin on the goods and services that we sell. I look at it a little bit differently. I look at it from a return on investment standpoint, just like we were just talking about with the innovation. So when I invest a dollar of profitability into sales and marketing, what's the return on that investment I get back in in profit and gross gross or marginal profit to the business? And you know, there's a couple of levers you can pull to increase that ROI, 
you know, your, your revenue, how much you're bringing in your variable costs, which is your operating expenses and your cost of customer acquisition. So I, I help my clients kind of look and dig into those three levers that they can pull to not just increase profitability, but increase that return on investment of their profit, because ultimately that's, what's going to make the business better positioned for, you know, a sale or an exit. No, I love that. And, and especially as, as, as you're even starting what you were saying, assigning purpose to profits. Yeah. Not just just that that they exist or that you are profitable on paper, but that the, you got to do something meaningful with that in order for it to really be of benefit and of value. And I think that that's, yeah, I mean, that's that's such an, a helpful way of seeing it that a lot of times, you know, people just don't see that, you know, just you want to make sure you're in the green and not in the red. And as long as, you know, to the degree to which that number is big enough that you feel good about it, and that's kind of sometimes the way people see it. I think another thing that I was fascinated by, you did a podcast, I think, on continuous improvement and scalability. And so there were a couple things in there that you just kind of started to touch on. So I want to I want to move into this domain completely with you. But let's let, let, let me start with the with the critical question that I remember seeing and reading and hearing. What is scalability? I am so glad you asked this question, Brian. It's a question I'm really passionate about. You know, you you referenced earlier in this conversation, right? The whole, you know, the graph that's just constantly up into the and I think most people associate scalability with that idea of scaling, right? The the growth chart that looks like a hockey that is typically associated with growth that is large in size and rapid in to me, what scalability actually means, right? That's what I just described as one kind of scalability, right? But scalability as a whole, what it actually means is the capacity to change the size and scale of your business. And I think where most people in, in that statement, the capacity to change in size, most people focus too much on the size part and not enough on the capacity part. The capacity is your ability to change in size. And that's not about big or small or fast or slow. That's about control, predictability, consistency, repeatability, so that you know, I want my clients to be in control of their business. I don't want their business to run them. I want them to run their business. And so by focusing on the capacity piece of how do we make this business a little bit more consistent and repeatable and predictable so that I'm in control, you know, I have my hand on the lever to choose when we speed up or slow down, when we grow in size or we pull back. That's really what my focus is with my clients. And I love that. And, and and I was probably, I think, the most excited to have this part of our conversation because because and I'm sure you and I could continue this for multiple hours. We won't, but I really like how you describe that. And and one of the things that I've found it, that seems pretty challenging across a lot of domains is kind of I categorize it and I describe it as like the operational stuff, in, inside stuff, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's your tech stack, the things that are are either efficient between tech people and process or not to use, to take a term out of a, a wonderful book, nudge, where they talk about on a macro level sludge. So things that create barriers to decision-making and all that other stuff. But I think, you know, like we, we've talked about as we go through cycles, growth, different parts of that business life cycle, as you will, it's kind of hard sometimes to see all of the internal things and the mechanisms and a lot of times, especially if you're if you're having a good period of time and you are experiencing rapid growth, you can rapidly outgrow things pretty quick. For sure. For sure. So how, you know, let's maybe kind of peek under the hood on some of the things that you run into and help people address. And maybe let's start with the technology stack first, because I, I can safely say we see that a lot of times most saliently in our practice when we're helping clients with employee benefits. As, as, a, as a very interesting window, how, how easy or difficult is it for you to hire somebody and then keep them yeah. on board and then provide them value? And how many systems have to be involved to do all of that? Yeah. So, you know, there's so much more a lot of times than just that component. So what, what do you do when you're working with somebody and maybe identifying, like, let's take a look at, at this from an operational or technology deployment standpoint? Yeah. And, and I, think, I think the first important thing to point out you know, one of the most common mistakes I see with businesses that are trying to scale is that they're spreading themselves too thin and focused on too many things, right? Like there's an infinite number of little, you know, processes and cogs under the hood of any business. And if you try to fix them all at once, then what you get is, is it's premature optimization. It's, it's not improving the business as a whole. And what you end up getting is that because 
your resources are spread across so many things, you're you're spending way too much time on things that aren't going to actually make much impact. Where instead, if you focused that time, resources, you know, and your capital on a couple of pivotal places, then you can have a much bigger impact on the organization. So, you know, I have to preface any conversation on technology on that because technology is very overwhelming for a lot of people. There's just a million options out there. We're constantly bombarded with the newest and the latest and the greatest. And, you know, now everyone's talking about AI and chatbots and how can we incorporate in our business? And it's like, let's all just calm down and take a breath, right? Because the thing that's going to have the biggest impact on your business is that one weakest link. And let's try to identify what that is so that we can solve that problem utilizing technology or otherwise, because that's going to have the biggest impact. You know, in I, I work a lot with services businesses where, you know, their product is people, right? Like what we're trying to do is manage and organize people's time and intellectual capacity in order to provide value to clients. So, you know, a lot of the technologies that I'm working on with my clients are things like how do we how do we better do project management? How do we manage workload or do, you know, capacity planning for for the future so that we're adequately staffed? How do we do uh, measure and track time? How do we manage our relationships with our clients CRM? So there's a lot in kind of arena of technology of just how do we collaborate better? How do we stay organized with what we're doing? And how do we have access to information that helps us be a little bit more agile to respond to what's going on day to day in the business? Um, Because the way that we do that does change as the business grows in size and complexity, as we kind of talked about at the start of this conversation. You know, a lot of my clients may start by running their business off a spreadsheet or off a whiteboard. But, you know, when you're servicing 100 clients a month, when you used to service 10 a month, you can't really do that anymore. So how do we put some technology to the table that helps us get that macro level view to make sure that things don't slip through the cracks and help our teams kind of just do what they do best in a more efficient way? I like, I like what you said, because it also, for us in, in, in our practice and even for our audience, because we work with the for-profit, but we also work with a lot of nonprofits and a lot of associations. And so that that whole, you know, our business is really people and relationships really, you know, translates across all of all of that pretty effectively. And I think that that's what you described as a common issue, regardless of, you know, how you how you file your taxes. And so how do you go about diagnosing and triaging that kind of like, what are the most salient things that we really want to address? Or, or you know, if there's six, what's mm-hmm. priority one, two, three to six? How do you do that? Sure. So f- first of all, you know, I have a framework that I bring to every engagement with a client where there, there's really kind of four main stages that a company grows through a, as they scale. It's traction, profit, capacity, and innovation. And just to t- quickly touch on each, traction is all about, do we have a consistent and repeatable process for acquiring new clients? Profit is, can we deliver our goods and services in a way that leaves enough profit on the table that we can reinvest into growth? We talked about that a second ago. Third is the capacity piece, which is as the business scales in size, are we able to take on more volume without balls being dropped, without things starting to break down? And fourth is innovation, which is, is there that organized and data-driven way that we're implementing new ideas? So right off the bat, I'm putting my clients into one of those four buckets, right? Based on where they are at in their growth. And we're only focusing on one of them. So so that's kind of layer number one. And then based on each one of those, typically we're kind of digging under the hood. There's going to be different metrics that we're looking at, whether, you know, in the profit category, we're looking at what's that, what's that marginal profit? What's that, you know, return on investment? If it's traction, we're looking at, you know, what's your customer conversion rate at each stage in the sales process? If it's capacity building, we're we're mapping out the process of, of your workflow to try to identify the specific steps where bottlenecks are occurring because that is what kills a team's ability to service volume is our bottlenecks in the process or defects where things are kind of getting through where they shouldn't. And, you know, each of those areas are going to help us hone in on, oh, okay, so the real bottlenecks are these parts of the process. Let's solve those problems, right? Or if we're looking at the the traction piece, it's where, where are the, where are clients falling off in that customer life cycle? Or if it's profit, where in that profitability model are the areas that are really taking away from profitability that we can look for opportunities for efficiency or or profit growth. Maybe it's changing pricing by pulling the revenue lever. Maybe it's 
incre- increasing efficiency in a particular part of the process will lower our variable expenses so that there's more profit. So each of those four buckets, we're kind of honing in on a particular area that's the weak point. And from there, it's just, you know, good old fashioned, uh, you know, consulting, let's just have a conversation, let's talk through the issues, let's problem solve, and let's figure out how we can actually alleviate those issues. Love that. I mean, and I love those four domains too, because, you know, each one does create such a helpful and appropriate framework to be able to zoom in and to see things, but to to see it with precision. Because, you know, I mean, it is, it's it's very hard to, you know, a lot of times you have a big picture perspective in general, but how do you kind of get in and diagnose, or maybe there's a symptom, but you just don't know what the root cause is, right? Exactly. You know, something's not right, exactly. but how do we figure it out? Um, exactly. And, and I think and, that, that, and if it hasn't been apparent, like I'm, I'm a big data guy, right? Like I, I yeah. numbers don't lie, <laughs> you know, like we can they tell ourselves not. any kind of story we want about what's going on and why, why it's going on, but like the numbers don't lie. So, and, and it's really about both, right? You have to be able to, to kind of take what the, the data is showing and map it to what our eyes are seeing on the ground and what we act inherently know about our organizations, because the marriage of those two is going to kind of tell the real story because data with that context is really helpful or actionable. So it's, it's, it's kind of a combination. Well, and I like that because yeah, it, it sometimes not having the data itself is the issue to be able to see things, but then also making sure that once you do have it, it becomes formative and you have a path to run down and, and then you know, signposts to know that you're you're on the right track or you've gotten off. I want to, you know, there's, there's, I feel like a part of a lot of this that comes together, but there's a domain that I think is also challenging. And I'm, I'm interested to kind of see how this fits into your engagements. And that's, you know, kind of the, the people part, the, the personnel and kind of the culture of an organization. You know, I know culture is, is a big word that has a lot of meaning. There's also a lot of focus and emphasis on creating good culture and also avoiding bad But it also is sometimes amorphous and intangible. And I think hard to kind of really, you know, create an effective context for it as it applies to an organization or to a business. So how how do you see that kind of coming into play? And and if it seems like maybe there's like a culture concern on some level or a personnel concern, how would you help somebody try to go about addressing that? Sure. I mean, first, I have to caveat that there are people out there who are not me that are so much better when it comes to sure. human resources, team dynamics, you know, culture building, leadership and management. But here's kind of the, the lens that I bring to the table on the subject of scalability. Because, you know, I, I've led teams before, uh, before starting my business, you know, I was the chief operating officer of, of a company. And the, one of the biggest kind of ethos that I bring to any team that I lead or, or client that I'm working with on the subject of culture is a mentality that we always look to blame the system first. Blame the system first. It's like, that is my culture ethos, which is when something goes wrong, inevitably things always go wrong, right? When something goes wrong in business, as an organization, our first response should be to try to look for, well, what went wrong with the system? What went wrong with our process, our policy, the tools we used, the the systems that are in place was there a breakdown in the system that explained why this happened? And if so, let's dig in and see if we can solve that problem before we look to just find blame in a person. And when you do that, what ends up happening is a couple of things. A, people don't fear retribution and they're more willing to share and be transparent when things go wrong. And they're now part of the process to solve the problem because they don't fear immediate retribution. But interestingly, it also holds people more accountable because when they know that their you know, supervisors, the company as a whole, will try to support them first and find fault in the system first, when we look to find fault in the system and there's nothing there, and it actually is the fault of the person, they're more likely to be accountable to that because they know that we've exhausted every other effort before we find fault in them as as a and they own it. They're more accountable. So I, I always... You know, I'm a big systems guy, and I think sometimes we can kind of take the humanity out of that, but great systems are what create great cultures and what allow people to be their best because they know what's expected. They have ways to, you know, measure their performance against those expectations, and they have the tools to do their job well. And if they don't, let's let's fix that so that they can do even better. Man, I could not have envisioned a better answer. I love I love that. And 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 I think again, we we share that common ethos dynamic of how do you, you know, I, I'm, I'm always big on, you know, the concept of getting everybody on the bus, 
And then once you're on the bus, getting everybody in the right seats. And I yeah. think so much of of that capacity building and, and what people would tangibly say good culture looks like is when people can show up, be their best selves and spend most of their time on the things that they're really good at. And a lot of times it's when someone is having to do things that either they're not good at, or maybe they just shouldn't be doing at all because of some kind of systemic inefficiency or, or just some kind of, maybe again, they're not in the right seat. Mm-hmm. And, and so being able to really figure that out is so materially helpful because then like you, like you described, it's this collaborative environment where we're all trying to, you know, make one another better while the organization gets better. And, and yeah, you, you definitely take the, uh, the fear and the air out of that notion that, you know, we're always going to go hunting for blame and find the person responsible yeah. and other stuff, which, you know, I think is, is sometimes, you know, not, not as easy to do in certain circumstances, depending on, you know, how people are wired and all the other stuff. But I think that that's such a, such a great approach. Yeah. But, but I mean, discipline is important in an organization. Accountability is important, but those things are actually really, really hard if you don't have strong systems and infrastructure in place, right? If you're just operating off the, off of a whim and kind of just relationships and that's it, like, that it's really hard to hold people to account in an environment like that. But when there's structure, when there's systems, it becomes a lot more easy. Just it's a lot smoother to be able to create that culture of distant accountability. No, I love that. Yeah. And 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 I think that that has, you know, it 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 directly fits back into all of those other things that you were talking about, all of those domains. And, you know, the better the system, the better the process, the better the culture, the better the overall deliverable that goes out because it's an yeah. inside out, right? When you, when you're really firing in all cylinders culturally as a team, as people, then your clients get the best version of you anyway. And that's, I mean, that's when everybody wins. Yeah. So, wow. Because I know I could literally continue this conversation with you for another hour. I want to kind of wind it down for now because we, man, we covered so much good ground and, and I'm so glad we could do that. So do you have any parting thoughts or any one thing that we didn't cover that you wanted to talk about? And in addition to that, any particular shout outs you want to make? Ah, that's that's a tough one. I mean, hey, just shout out to all the entrepreneurs out there. Like here, here. this thing we do is so difficult. It's entrepreneurship's challenging. It's it's the hardest thing I've ever done. But because of that, it has created this amazing opportunity for me to kind of grow not only as a professional, but as a person. I've learned more about myself as an individual, <laughs> as a person through entrepreneurship than anything else I've ever done. So like shout out to all the entrepreneurs that are doing it out there. Like it, it takes it takes guts. You know, I, I think often on the subject of entrepreneurship, it, it's really easy to put success stories on pedestals and to think that the version of what it means to be successful in business is one thing. It's like the thing that we see on TV and in Forbes and Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine really does a disservice. And I think ultimately what it makes people think is that what you need to be successful is a great idea and a lot of hard work and grit. I think that's what people think is required to be successful in business. And that's not true. And I know it because I've seen a lot of great ideas run by businesses, business owners who work their butts off fail. And I'm one of them. Like this is my third business. I've been through two others that ultimately closed shop. So if it was just about grit and a good idea, then there'd be a lot more successful business out there. What it actually is required to be successful in business is systems, structure, and just the discipline to continuously improve. You just got to keep doing the thing And each small and incremental improvement to the business stacked up over time is what actually takes you across the finish line. So as you kind of navigate that journey of of incremental improvement, just remember that A, you're doing your best and that's usually enough. And B, when it comes to the amount of time, resources, and energy that you have, just be really smart about where you're putting and focusing those efforts because focusing that energy on a few critical things is going to have a much bigger impact than um, trying to do too many things all at once. So that's a long and uh, rambling way to kind of answer that, that, that final question on kind of what, how I view entrepreneurship and success. And now that was, that was beautiful. And, and I wanted, I'm just going to pull out one of the words that you just said, impact. Yeah. I think that's one for me that speaks a lot. You know, it doesn't all have to look a particular way, but most of the people that I know in any form of success built their lives around impact. And, and, and so, and, and having that connection and an understanding 
You don't have to look like, you know, the top Inc. 500. That's okay. But you can have a massive impact and fly under the radar and still do amazing things. Yep. So amen. Here, 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 here to everything that you just said. My friend, thank you so much for being on with me. This was a great time. And I think I will I will say this. It'll be a plug for us to have a part two to this conversation. Okay. Because yeah. uh, I because because I have so many notes that I was writing down. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to we're going to have to do this again sometime. So uh, there's a plug for a future recording. How's that sound? That sounds great. Let's do it. All right. Thank you, my friends. Oh, last thing. I can't forget this. How can somebody get a hold of you? Because you're amazing. And I'm sure a lot of the audience wants to reach out and pick your brain and probably work with you. So how what's the best way for somebody to get a hold of you? Sure. Thanks for asking. You can find me on LinkedIn, Brad Eisenberg. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Or you can go to my website. It's beleanbusiness.com. And there's a lot of great information on what I do, but also just a lot of great resources and stories about you know business scalability in general. So beleanbusiness.com. Sign up for the blog. I did. I love it. Great <laughs> stuff. Thank you, my friend. All right. information provided in this podcast is not intended as specific tax or legal advice and may not be relied upon for purposes of avoiding any federal tax penalties. The Haney Company, its employees and representatives are not authorized to give tax or legal advice. Individuals are encouraged to seek advice from their own tax or legal counsel. Individuals involved in the estate planning process should work with an estate planning team, including their own personal legal or tax counsel. The information provided here does not constitute personal financial advice, but is meant as the conveyance of information for educational purposes only. All investing involves risk, including the risk of loss. Past performance is not indicatory of future returns. Guarantees are backed by the claims paying ability of the insurer. Brian Heaney is a registered representative and an investment advisory representative of Dempsey Lord Smith LLC. Dempsey Lord Smith LLC is not affiliated with the Heaney Company. Securities offered through Dempsey Lord Smith LLC, Membra, Finra, Sipic. Advisory services offered through Dempsey Lord Smith LLC, a U.S. SEC registered investment advisor.